mindset in Barry Zito's time at Thrash. Barry Zito, at the end of his career, if you remember, um, he, he left San Francisco, really, the San Francisco fans almost wanted to drive him out uh, of San Francisco. They were fed up with him, they didn't think he pitched very well, he was very well overpaid, and so they wanted to get rid of him. And he wanted to make a comeback. Nobody had resigned him, and so he got a hold of me in early October, and said, hey, Ron, I don't know, uh, my name is Barry Zito. I don't know if you've heard of me. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> Barry Zito, and I would like to train at the ranch in the entire offseason. Heard a lot of good things about it. My velo, when I was with the, uh, with the A's, when I went to Cy Young, um, I had, uh, was sitting 92, now I'm down to 83, 84. Uh, I heard you kind of help guys with that and uh, I'd like to give it a shot. So he trained with us the entire time. And he is a very odd individual, very, uh, very difficult to work with in this way. He's very cerebral, and, uh, and he's, he's really very specific on what he wants, but overall he was a true professional, and I, and I just talked to him the other day. He's a, he is a, a songwriter in Nashville. So if you're worried about Barry Zito, don't worry, don't worry about Barry Zito. He's doing just fine. So if you're worried, he's good, right? He's got, still got his money in the bank. He's still got a supermodel wife. He's good. He's writing songs. He's writing songs in Nashville. He's living the dream, right? And uh, I, I just listened to one of his songs uh, a couple weeks ago, and I wrote him back, and I said, Barry, it was, you know, he's not a very good singer. Um, and, uh, but he wrote the song, and I really liked it, and I sent him a little text, and I said, Hey, Barry, I, and it kind of made, brought tears to my eyes, and he goes, Hey, Ron, thanks a lot. How are the, how's everybody at the ranch? And so, anyhow, Barry Zito, <clears throat> the reason I bring his name up <clears throat> is here's why uh, we use the who, who wrote that rule so often, <clears throat> is he was about a week from breaking going to spring training, and Barry came up to me at the end, of the meeting, and we're heading down to the training barns, and he goes, hey, Ron, uh, I know I don't ask for very much, and he didn't. I said, but, but I have a request. And I said, okay, right? I didn't have any idea what he was going to request. And he said, I would like you to do who wrote that and rule one more time. He goes, it just, for whatever reason, it really resonated with me, and I want to see it again. I go, sure. So I'm going to share with you who wrote that effing rule? And, I'll t and so you'll see it. And by the way, what I'm going to do is if anybody wants this, um, I will make this event so you can actually use this for your players if you'd like to. Because you'll see, I think it's very good, right? Um, so this is the reason I made it PG in case, uh, in case you, <laughs> you have to show it to somebody. It's a PG thing. Um, so the message for our athletes in this specific mindset is that you are capable of so much more than you think is possible. And be very careful in accepting the arbitrary rules someone else gives you. That's the message, right? So <clears throat> what young athletes really need today is indeed what we needed when we were their age. It hasn't changed. What, what do our young athletes that are under us really need? Here's what they need. They need perspective. Right? There's both wider and deeper than they are. Right? They don't know. A lot of them just think they, they're, they're not very worldly. They, even though they're smart, they haven't experienced life like we have. And so they think the failures that they have is just so big and no one else has ever experienced that. I'm throwing balls. Oh my gosh, I walked a guy the other day. How bad, that terrible that is. I, I gave up a, a walk-off home run. This has never been done before, right? No. It's been done a lot of times. It's been done 150 years long, right? So they need a wider and deeper perspective. They also need a, a healthy sense of proportion, and they need a vision, a picture of the possible. John Wood always talked about painting a picture of the possible. And then they need many, many stories of success. They need stories of failure, and they need stories of overcoming obstacles. So if you want to take your phone out, this is what I think, that I think a lot of people, when you're teaching young people, this is what I think they really need, right? All right, so let me give you a primary example of a, a rule that is an arbitrary one, right? 
If I said to you, if God had meant man to fly, he would have given him wings, right? You'd go, yeah. That's it, right? right? Now, in 1900, right around the turn of the, the 20th century, man all over the world was trying to create man-made flight. And if you remember from your history books, Orville and Wilbur Wright and Kitty Hawk, North Carolina were the first ones to have that. Now, do you, how many people before 1903 had ever flown in an airplane? And that would be zero. Zero. So, in 1903, if I would have said this, if God had meant man to fly, he would have given him wings. How many uh, listening to that would go, that's right. That's right. Makes perfect sense. So, if Orville and Wilbur Wright would have accepted, if God would have meant man to fly, he would have given him wings as the truth, we would know this. They wouldn't have been the ones that created man-made flight. They didn't accept that rule. They, they said, no, I, I, I don't believe that. Right? They, in essence, said, who wrote that effing rule? I don't believe it. Now, your players, I'm going to get to this, your players have been given rules that you don't even remember or haven't even heard, like, you'll never throw it hard. You're never going to have any power. You're never going to be a good base runner. You're never on and on. You're too short. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're too stiff. You're too, right? You're, it's just full of them. And so they're filled with these rules. Some of them you know, some of them you don't know, and some of them, unfortunately, you might have given them. That's what I'm trying to bring out. So, what I tell our players is this. Beware of rules which sound good. Sound clever and smart. Phrases that seem benign, but instead become mental impediments to self-fulfilling prophecy. You're never going to throw it hard. I tell you, 12-year-old kid, you're never going to throw it hard, son. If he internalizes that, that becomes his reality. There's a pitcher that I, that I worked with from the time he was in 8th grade until he was with the Cleveland Indians, Trevor Bauer, one of the worst athletes ever to be at the ranch. Terrible athlete. 17-inch vertical jump. Serious. So his, if he took off his shirt, you would go, please put it on. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Right? And yet, he did not accept a rule that he's never going to do what? Throw it hard, he did, right? And yet, that young man throws it 105, 107 miles an hour on a turning bird, right? An elite, elite throw. So he did not allow this to occur. So let me give you an example. So uh, here's some examples. You're never going to throw it 90 or 95 or 100. You're never going to throw a good curveball. You never play at the X level. You never play at the Division I level. You never play at the professional level. You'll never be a major league guy. You'll never be tall enough, strong enough, fast enough. Your team will never win X, and you'll never be as good as X. This is really dangerous, right? So we always compare somebody. You're never going to be as good, right? I love Russell Wilson. If you don't know who Russell Wilson is, the quarterback of Seattle. Uh, Seattle was, when they said, uh, are you surprised... You were in the Super Bowl, and he goes, no, why not me? What a great rule. Why not me? Somebody's got to be in the Super Bowl. Somebody has to be the quarterback in the Super Bowl. Why not me? Right? So now, instead of the Texas Baseball Ranch, we train our athletes, and here's, what, here's the notes that I want you to take today. Teach your kids to say, who wrote that effing rule? I'm never going to let what I can't do or what I don't have interfere with what I do have or what I can do. And we do this all the time. We do it. Let alone our players, right? Have you ever caught yourself, well, I can't do that. I don't have that. We do it all the time. Instead of focusing on what I do have and what I can do, so often we focus on what we don't have and what we can't do. And a lot of times, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, it's not... I focus on what I can't do yet, or what I don't have yet. It doesn't mean I'm never going to have it, but I focus on what I can't and what I don't. And then the last one is, I'm never going to confuse impossible with what is difficult, extremely challenging. We do that all the time, too. Well, that's impossible. Well, is it impossible, or is it extremely difficult? 
So some of you are like, oh no, it's, it's just semantics. No, it's not. Let me ask you this. If you had a favorite pet, and the pet was really sick, and you took him to the veterinarian, and the veterinarian said, I'm sorry, Ron, it's impossible. He's going to pass away. Or if the doctor said, you know what, it's going to be extremely difficult. It's going to be a challenging thing, but we may be able to pull that off. Is there a difference between those two? Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's fairly close, but it's the most gigantic gap in the history of man. The difference between impossible and what is extremely challenging. The Wright brothers knew that man-made flight was going to be extremely challenging. And they were going to work at it until they got it. And so a lot of people just went, that's impossible. Most of the world says that's impossible until when? It happens. Right? All right. So now, I'm going to have to say, I'm going to cue you. Let's practice this one. Let's just say, who wrote that rule? So we just take that out. I want you to practice this real quick with me. When I say, what, you say, who wrote that rule? Got it? That's what I want. So as we go. I'm going to say it, and then you repeat after me who wrote that rule. Here's the rule. We know that you can't play soccer if you don't have feet. Who wrote that rule? What does he not have? Feet. Where is he playing soccer? Where? Brazil. How's Brazil? How's soccer in Brazil? Pretty good. Pretty good. Right? There's two religions in Brazil that I know of. There's Catholicism and soccer. Right? So, never confuse with what is impossible with extremely difficult. Now, is it impossible to play soccer without any feet? Now, before today, if I'd have got you in the hallway before lunch and I said, can you play soccer without any feet, how many would go, no, right? You'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. Now, is it extremely challenging? I can only imagine. Right? Also, if he focuses on what he doesn't have or what he can't do, is he ever going to play soccer? Right? What does he have to do? He has to figure, he has to focus on what he can do and what he does have. Same as what us every single day. All right, now, next rule. I hope we do better with that. Who wrote that rule? It's kind of weak, by the way, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we know you can't wrestle if you don't have arms and legs. Who wrote that rule? Much better. What does this young man not have? Arms and legs. When a referee holds the wrestler's arm up, what does that mean? Winner. winner. He won. Don't feel sorry for him. He pinned the guy. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. He went 40 and 11 in high school and went on to wrestle in college. Now, is it impossible to wrestle with no arms and no legs? Obviously not. Is it very difficult? Yes. Of course. Right? If he focuses on what he doesn't have or what he can't do, is he ever going to wrestle? No. I tell my minor league guys all the time, if you have a friend without, with any arms or legs, I don't think the first thing that comes out of your mouth is you should try wrestling. I don't think so. And yet he was an elite wrestler. Okay. All right. That was much better. Let's see if we can keep it up for about 10 more minutes, okay? All right, we know that you can't be an elite caliber archer without arms or an Olympic track star without a tibia or a fibula. Who wrote that rule? Bronze medal winner. We all know this guy. He was in the news for killing his girlfriend, right? This slide was much better five years ago. That's <laughs> <laughs> the, the only one I got, right? So now, here's the point, right? Who would have thought... Who would have thought this is possible? Who would, how hard is it to be an Olympic sprinter anyway? And yet he did it with that. Right? If you focus on what you can't do and you focus on what you don't have, you're sunk. So the reason I bring this up to my players, if you're going to focus on what you can't do, or you're going to focus on what you can do, can't, you're going to be buying a ticket to a baseball game for the rest of your life. You're not going to be in it. The only time you get to the baseball stadium is buying a ticket. You're going to Washington. 
If you want to be on the field of play, you got to focus on what you can do, and you got to focus on what you do have, and make and maximize that. You know that you can't be a concert pianist without hands or fingers. <laughs> this young man, when he was 10 years old, he's in China, was playing hide and go seek. He grabbed a hold of the cord, an electrical cord, it was hot, it almost killed him, he had to amputate both of his le arms. He had a love for music and he went to seven different music teachers and asked all of them, he said, can you Teach me to play piano with my finger, uh, with my feet, and they said, no. that's impossible. They said this, tell me if this doesn't sound right. They said, the feet, the piano was made for the hands, and the feet don't have the dexterity to play the piano. Doesn't that sound right? But that's poison, isn't it? Yeah. That's poison to him. What's the only shot he's got? If he accepts that as true, never play the piano, right? I don't know about you, my feet, I can't play the piano with my fingers. <laughs> and my feet barely made it into my shoes this morning. I don't have any dexterity in them, right? So it is very difficult, but he figured it out. And he won, China's Got Talent, and I would highly recommend you go on YouTube and listen to him play. It is amazing, <laughs> right? Focus on what you can do. And what you do have. We know that you can't possibly play in the NBA if you're five six. Oh, 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 we're getting weak again. <laughs> Spud Webb, five six. Not only did he play in the NBA, he played in the NBA for 14 years. Not only did he play in the NBA for 14 years, he was an all-star. And not only was he an all-star. But he won the slam dunk contest. How do you like them apples? <laughs> huh? I got some. Yeah? Right? Who says that? He, who wrote that rule? Right? Watch me. His Spud Webb's rule is watch me. Probably could say a couple things after that. But watch me. Just watch me. Now, here's what most of my kids miss, and it may be what your kids miss. Don't stay stuck on stupid. All of us sometimes get stuck on stupid. I get stuck on stupid sometimes. Right? Now here's what it is. Stuck on stupid is this question. Is there a disadvantage to being 5'6 in the NBA? No kidding. Is there a disadvantage to being small in the NBA? Please, that's easy, right? If that's all you think about, you're Homer Simpson or Al Bundy. Got his hand in his pants right there, <laughs> right? But that's, I don't know if you guys remember all. Was it uh, married with children? Married with children, right? Classic. Classic. Now, what would these two gentlemen say? Two of the best coaches that have ever coached in America: Bill Belichick, John Wooden. Yeah, I'd like that. This is your trophy case. Oh, he's pretty good, right? Now. Here's the question my guys never ask. Could, what could possibly be the advantages to being 5'6 in the NBA? Are there some advantages of being 5'6 in the NBA? Sure. When a guy's 7 foot, the thing from his hand to the floor is a long way. And if I'm 5'6, that's in my sweet spot, baby. <laughs> he, led the, he led the NBA many times on steals. We don't ever ask that question. There's a, is there an advantage to throwing 100 miles an hour in the major leagues? Yes. Is there a disadvantage? Yes. Is there an advantage? Is there a disadvantage to throwing 80 miles an hour in the make big leagues? Yes. Is there an advantage? Yes. Your job is to figure out what it is, but we still get caught in this other stuff. So do not get stuck on stupid. Right? Don't allow yourself to stay there. All of us occasionally get stuck on stupid. Just go and move on. Right? Think differently. All right. We know in the current game of baseball, we got one more. Let's see if we can bring it home. 
We know in the current game of baseball where everyone is bigger and stronger, you can't possibly be an MVP of the league if you're 5'6 and weigh 162 pounds. If you're a Yankee fan, you're not going to like this next one. Right there. Now, okay? One of these three is an MVP. One of these two is an MVP. Right? Never confuse impossible with it. It's extremely difficult. Never let what I can't do or what I don't have interfere with what I can do and what I do have. Right? This is the message. It's good for us. But how much, how important is it to a 16, 18, 21 year old kid? Incredibly important. They don't get that. They don't get that message very often. That's why coaching is so important that it was Tom was talking about. This is where we change lives. All right. We see, we believe if you have a big enough why, you'll figure out the how. It'll become self-evident. If your why is big enough, you'll find out the how. Constantly working and reinforcing your strength in your player's why. And now, we're almost finished. I think you kind of understand why Barry Zito liked that so much. The next thing you're going to tell me, Coach Wolforth, with all your positive, feel-good stuff, and I, by the way, I get this all the time, right? Ron Wolforth is just this cheerleader guy in Texas that says, you can do it! And and really pumps guys, pumps hot air up their, up their skirt and, and really gets them pumped up. Is there anything that I've told you today that's not the truth? Did a soccer guy with no feet play soccer, yes or no? Yes. Wrestle with no arms or no legs, yes or no? Yes. Play the piano with his feet, yes or no? Yes. And the truth, we don't tell our guys it's easy. Did you see anything in there that I said, success is easy? No. We painted a picture of the possible. <clears throat> the rest of it is up to you. That's why motivation is so important. Every single day, we talk about that. Now, you're going to say something absolutely absurd, like a, with a big enough Y, a dog can actually permanently walk upright on two legs. Now, I'm getting ridiculous, all right? This is really outside, so I would never tell you something that crazy. I mean, that, that's absurd. <laughs> Faith the dog. Born without two front paws. Now, this isn't, she didn't get it taken off later. She was born without it. Okay? So now. This is my, one of my favorite stories. I'll tell you the story about Faith the Dog. When she was born, they found her. They found her under in a in a garage, and they took her to a veterinarian. And what did the veterinarian say? Put her down. Now, tell me that this doesn't sound logical. The veterinarian said, "Dogs can't live with two legs. They walk on four, so she'll never walk. She'll just right. So she's going to die anyway. You just need to just." Put her down, right? You're gonna. That's gonna be the good thing to do. So, but they couldn't do it. They rejected that advice, expert advice, and they taught her to walk by putting peanut butter on a spoon, and she would hop, and then they, she would eat, and pretty soon she walked. Now, here's my favorite part of the story. When she was about one year old, of course, what do you do with dogs that are one? You got to go get them their shots. Imagine the face of the veterinarian, same one, in the office, in walks Faith the dog. I'm here for my shots, doc. And he goes, right? So he comes in there and he swoops her up and he takes her to the x-ray machine. And he says, the bone structure is like something I've never seen before. Well, of course it is. That dog 
was forced to walk without two, with it, walk just on her back too. So her bones developed differently than the average dog. Of course. Right? Based on the stress, the body adjusts and adapts. Right? This is what most people miss. Now, I'm going to tell you this. We hear this all the time, and your players hear this all the time, and this is the one way to get me, I don't have very many pet peeves, this is the one that makes me fighting mad. This is the one, if you want to get me in a, in a fighting mood, just tell me, well, this is just a, gene it's a genetic thing, they're just, right? So somehow, you're a good player just because of your genes. Genes tell us where we start. They don't tell us where we finish, that's up to you. Her grandmother, do you think she lived, she, her grandmother, do you think she had four legs or two? Four. Her mother? Four. She didn't have the option. She had to figure it out. She, in, she succeeded in spite of her genetics, not because of it. Genetics tells us where we start. It is such a crock of crap. It is a huge crutch. The coaches go, well, that person, they're just not genetically capable of that. What, what about the Altuve? Would the, the genetic fairy dismiss him one night? Well, he was gifted in other ways, wasn't he? you got to focus on what you can do and what you do have. Right? So, this is important message. Number two, human development. The true power is in how big your why is or isn't. The soccer player without any feet, how big a why does he have to have to overcome that? Huge. The wrestler with no arms and no legs. The piano player with no fingers. So here's Norman Vince's appeal. The more and this is, a, this is one that we talk about at the ranch all the time. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about a legacy program that we do. We teach leadership at the ranch. It's the number one thing we teach. Not a fastball. You may lose your fastball one day, but if you never lose your, your legacy and your humanity, your humility, then you're still a good person, right? You're going to be able to help people. The more you lose yourself in something bigger than yourself, the more energy you will have. And it's really true. And lastly, Motivating athletes is not a small thing or a sometime thing. It's a big, huge, everyday thing. Every day. I ask my players all the time, did you shower today? Did you brush your teeth? Yeah. Well, then that'll, how long will that last you? <coughs> well, same thing with motivation. you got to continually do that. Simon Sinek says, success is really a matter of intensity. It's rather a matter of consistency. Right? You don't go to the gym for nine hours one day and, you, and all of a sudden become good. You, it's consistency that makes exceptional performance. And Aristotle, one of my favorite pitching coaches, <laughs> I told that to Aristotle. True story. True story. This is kind of sad, but it's a true story. I said, I made that joke with my minor league guys. We had about 18 of them that day. And I go, well, my favorite pitching coach, Aristotle. And the kid goes, Aristotle. I go, yeah, I pitched for the Reds in the, in the late 50s. And uh, he goes, yeah, I, I think I <laughs> <laughs> A lot of work to do there. <laughs> so we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. And my last slide, the final question I have for you is this. What habits are you creating in your athletes on a daily basis? What habits are you creating in your athletes on a daily basis? That's the question. I ask my staff, what habits are we creating? Just explain it to me. Right? You have... Here's my last message to you and every player that I come in contact with. You have everything you need to build something far bigger than yourself. You have everything you need to build something far bigger 
than yourself. Even if you don't have feet, even if you don't have arms and legs, even if you don't have fingers to play the piano, even if you're five, six, you have, you have everything you need. Focus on that. Don't focus on what you can't do and what you don't have. Thank you very much.